I think we'll um, we'll start with Owen, uh, and he's going to give us a little overview of where we are with mineral science and what mineral science can do to play, you know, uh, to play its part in the in the climate debate. So first of all, you know, do we have minerals that we can mine in Ireland that are that are useful now? I mean, what do we mine in Ireland, and you know, what's the difference between quarrying and mining? And uh, give us a little overview on that. Oh, oh sorry, we're going to start with the slides. <laughs> we'll start with the slides first, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> oh, thanks for the introduction, Marcus. I'll uh, answer any questions you want at any stage. Don't, don't worry about it. So um, I think when people see the slide coming up here, you'll see two images next to each other. And um, these are just uh, intended to kind of give us an overview of how minerals um, interacts with what we're trying to do in the climate crisis and how we're trying to, to help to solve that. And really, the two, the two big areas are what we talk about when we talk about circular economy and also when we talk about the, um, the transition to green energy. So what I've put up here are um, two images. And the first one on the left you'll see is just a, a snapshot of the, the raw materials that we need for, for wind energy. And we could do the same thing for when we look at um, solar energy and we could do the same thing when we look really at any form of renewable electricity. And electricity is what we're talking about when we talk about decarbonizing our, our energy um, ecosystem. And so you can see that there's a huge change in the the raw materials and the minerals that we are going to need over the next 10 to 20 years compared to what we have used over the last 30 to 40 or even 100 and 200 years that things that we formerly relied on like um, iron like copper and nickel and tin and um, metals and alloys like bronze that we make from copper and tin these are now being supplanted by these high-tech minerals that we're looking for so rare earth elements that are needed for um, for very strong magnets, and the magnets then are used in, in generation. And we're going to see a real shift in the number of raw materials that we're using and the number of metals. If you look at an average smartphone, it can have up to 40 different elements um, involved in that. And 40 different elements off the periodic table is quite a big chunk of the, the elements that we know are out there. And each one of those will have to be mined and extracted from the earth and, and refined to be used in, in these processes. And then on the right-hand side of the, the slide, we see an image of the circular economy. And I know we're probably going to talk a, a little bit about this um, later on in, in the, the evening. And everybody is really trying to push, to push us towards a circular economy where we minimize waste and we recycle and reuse an awful lot of, of what we produce. And I think the key to, to this image here is to show that even with a circular economy, you still need the inputs of the raw materials. So we still need more material input into the system and what's really important then is that we can minimize the waste of that material so that when something gets into the system, it stays in the system, it gets recycled, it gets reused. But what we're going to see, with, particularly with these high-tech minerals and high-tech raw materials, is that we haven't produced enough of them in the past to be able to rely solely on recycling. So we can have a little chat about that as the, as the evening goes on. But that's a, a rough overview of how minerals and mining is going to contribute to, um, to greening our society. I have a couple of questions starting with Owen. I just, as a broad overview, I suppose, just to understand uh, mining and mining in Ireland, for example. And also, is mining the right term? I'm thinking of it, extracting resources from the ground and is quarrying and is mining. Just give me an overview of that. And then also, what we do here in Ireland already. Well, um, the difference between mining and quarrying can be quite subtle at times. So <clears throat> in Ireland, we think of mining as anything which extracts of what we term a scheduled mineral. So it's something that's controlled at a, a national level. So you could have something like Connemara marble, for example, which is actually mined, whereas another limestone is quarried. So it can be quite subtle. Oh, it's like a, it's a legal de definition. It's a legal it's definition. Okay. In so it's not a geological science definition. It's in, in geological science, we would sort of understand it as something that is, if we're mining something, it's something that we extract and then probably process or we extract it from underground. And in general, we talk about mining metals and quarrying rock. So if we're getting, taking something out as use for use as a rock itself, then that would be considered quarrying. And your science is covering both. It I is, suppose. it's covering yeah. both, yeah. yes. Extraction of resources from the ground. Exactly. So I suppose the, the big one is, uh, what are we doing in here in Ireland, first of all? Are do we, any of that going on? I know that we quarry some rocks. Well, we do. We have do quite we... a lot of quarries. I mean, there are about 500 major quarries, and yeah. we produce 40 million tonnes of aggregate every year. It's a, a significant amount of material to build our roads, our houses, schools, hospitals. And then on the metal side and the mining side, we're internationally we're a really important producer of zinc we have tyra mine in up in navan which is i think 
largest zinc mine in Europe and one of the top 10 largest mines in the world. The largest in Europe, one Absolutely. of the top in the world, zinc. Yeah, okay. really, really big mine. It's barely noticeable because it, it's, um, the majority of it is underground in, in um, Navan, just outside Navan town. And so that's a huge mine, huge employer, about 600 people working there. So it's a, a really important part of the, the local um, industrial ecosystem as well. And then Ireland as a zinc producing and zinc potential country is really, really important as well. We're one of the most, most prospective areas in the world. And that's not just according to us, according to the USGS and internationally we're recognized. There's a specific type of deposit called an Irish type deposit, which is named after the style of mineralization we get here. And so we can see um, you have an active mine in, in Navan. We have a, a mine undergoing planning permission in Galmoy at the moment. And then we have really quite advanced development and prospective um, projects down in Limerick and Palace Green. And um, so that's on the zinc side. We also have quite good lithium prospects. Lithium. And so there are a lot of companies looking at lithium, particularly along the, the Black Stairs and the Wicklow, Wexford, Carlow region as well. And that's something that could be really, really important, particularly when we talk about climate and, and decarbonizing our transport in particular. Yeah, that's, I didn't realize we had good lithium potential here because the, the big, as you know, the big question mark around how much we can electrify our vehicles and even electrify the, you know, getting the batteries into the grid, the batteries are going to be a huge part of the future for climate change, uh, is where the lithium come from, <laughs> you know, and, and cobalt question mark is there, there too, you know, with the ethics of mining around that. But uh, fascinating to hear that we have potential for lithium in Ireland. Can it be extracted cost effectively here? What's what are the what are the potentials? Well, it's it's potential to yeah, it is potentially there as a as an economic deposit. I mean, companies are looking at it, and the interesting thing about it as well in Ireland, it's what we call a hard rock lithium. So mm. people would have heard an awful lot about lithium brines and how water intensive the, the process is, and you look at places like um, Nevada, the Atacama Desert, and. South America, where you have really arid places, but you have these lithium brines that people are extracting lithium for, and it's, it's hugely water intensive. So you have a very water intensive pro process in an area where water is, is really at a premium. Oh, wow. And so that causes a lot of, a lot of challenges. Because they're well. using but, the water to mine the lithium. To, well, you, yes, you're using water to process the lithium because the lithium process. exists in a, in a brine and you need, you need a, a, a vast amount of water to process it. Yeah. And so in Ireland, what we have is lithium and what we call uh, pegmatites and it occurs in a mineral called spodumene. And that's associated with the margins of the Leinster granite, really. Okay. That's where we find it in, in Ireland. So the Leinster granite extends from you know, from Dawkey in Dublin all the way down to kind of south of Mount Leinster. Oh, the lithium is in, in the granite. I know the, a lot of granite. It's next to the granite. Next to the granite. Yeah. So it comes together as a, as a kind of a... So it comes a together. Brain. It's, it's yeah. related with the granite. There, there, there have been discussions amongst yeah. researchers about how it actually happens. Does it, is it a part of the granite or is it local rocks that are melted when the granite comes in and the lithium gets concentrated? And in some places you have... Um, you have local melted rocks which have a lot of lithium in them and in other places you have the same rocks and they've no lithium in it. So it's quite tricky sometimes from an exploration point of view then to find exactly which rocks have a lot of lithium in them and exactly which uh, ones don't have much. And then um, what, what would happen if it becomes a, a proper mine or mm -hmm. um, an extractive process is the lithium would be extracted, it would be crushed and it would be processed. It would probably be processed abroad somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens with, with the zinc, for example. We extract the zinc in Ireland and the major smelting it happens in Scandinavia where you can send material, for example, to Norway and it will be processed there where it's 100% hydroelectric power. So uh, yeah. it's actually becomes a much more ecologically and environmentally so we, friendly we process. So here, send it to yeah, Norway or France or Sweden, have very low carbon grids so they can process it there. But they don't have the geological resource there, so it would have they have to ship exactly. across. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So, uh, I mean, uh, the potential then is zinc and lithium, both in Ireland, and could this grow a lot? Grow exponentially? Is it, I mean, uh, I can see certainly the need for a lot more lithium, and there's already question marks whether the world has enough. That, well, or or whether we can extract enough on time to meet the demands of the electric car market and. I think you know where does Ireland fit in there globally? You know, is it a big player potentially? Um, in lithium, we're not a huge player, okay. but on a European level, what's really important is that we have strategic supply and we have security of supply, so yeah. that we know where we can get these materials yeah. um, as and when we need them. Yeah. For zinc, we are a globally very inter very important player on the okay. international scene. We're a big producer, even with only one operating mine at the moment, and that's because it is such a, a world class deposit. Yeah. And zinc 
at the moment, 80 to 90 percent of zinc is used for galvanizing mm -hmm. and galvanizing. People think it's quite boring, but environmentally, it's really, really important because the economic and environmental cost of corrosion. So of materials mm -hmm. rusting is vast every year. The amount of iron and steel that rusts and has to be replaced and replaced at huge environmental and carbon cost mm -hmm. is enormously huge. You're talking in the billions and billions of dollars across the, the world. And the easiest way to prevent that is to galvanize the iron. And galvanizing is simply putting a very, very small coating of zinc on the outside of the material. So when you see your um, nice shiny farm gates, they've been galvanized. You see the um, corrugated material on the roof of farm sheds or on barns. And it's, it really is in farming that we see a, a huge amount of this. Those are all um, galvanized and galvanized means there's a little bit coating of zinc on the outside and that prevents it from rusting and that's just, a lot of that's coming from ireland that, that, Abs that absolutely yeah we produce quite a lot and then going forward zinc is going to be important i think uh, really important as a battery material and, and everybody knows you can get little zinc batteries but what's really going to be important in the next 10 to 20 years is what we can do with zinc on a grid scale and so we can you, there's a new technology it's relatively relatively new in production but it's been known about for a long time and it's called zinc air and the, the zinc air technology you get very very good batteries but they're quite large now size doesn't really um doesn't really matter if you're having a grid battery it's really important if you want to put a battery in a car or if you want to put a battery in a mobile phone which is why the trans travel batteries and phone batteries and laptop batteries are all lithium ion batteries but when we're looking at a grid scale then we could look at something like zinc air which ultimately will be safer there won't be the same fire risk it'll be cheaper and it will be um, more cost efficient. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, and we can see that the potential for zinc, I mean, we need to, our grid is really challenged by, you know, obviously we've got a wind coming onto the grid and we need a lot of wind, to, to do a lot of power demand, but the wind doesn't blow all the time. So batteries potentially could fit some of that gap. I, I know they can't fit at all because we can't build batteries quick enough and fast enough and probably cheap enough, but they're going to be playing some role in the grid, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, we see it in places like in Australia, there's um, a yeah. wonderful example of the Hornsdale Power Reserve, where yeah. you have this um, gigantic uh, Tesla battery and Tesla built it. Mm. It's a Samsung battery. It's equivalent to about 40,000 car batteries. So mm. this is a really big facility. It sits immediately adjacent to a wind farm mm. and it acts as as um as two in two functions really it backs up the wind power when yeah. there is some demand in the grid and it also provides um provides a buffer to the grid so yeah. you know in that half time in the match when everybody goes to put the kettle on mm. this battery can discharge that extra little bit of power and it yeah. prevents brownouts it prevents blackouts yeah. and it prevents us having to fire up a, a gas powered beaker plant as well for yeah. example i can see us needing a lot more of that in the future and certainly the lithium i mean even if we're not one of the bigger global players Europe produces a huge amount of cars and, and we're trying to switch those over to electric cars quickly. The Germans are already doing it, the Volkswagen are doing it. And in the next five or 10 years, we're going to see a huge demand for lithium batteries. And I know there's going to be a big power play between China and, and the other car producers. China are trying to produce much more cars and take over the European you know, car market, really, and, and try to be the, the world leader in electric cars. They possibly have bigger access to lithium Better, better access to lithium resources than, than Europe, or well, they, how does that play out? Um, the lithium resources are available all over the world, really. Okay. But what we yeah. what we see at the moment is that most of the processing capacity is in is in China. So yeah. the material, even if it's mined, for example, in South America or mm. somewhere in in Africa or in in Asia, mm. somewhere mm. A, a lot of it is sent to China for processing. So mm. it's not necessarily that they have more resources than us. It's just that they have the capacity to process. They currently have a strategic the advantage there. So they they so for Europe to get together and say, look, we need our own lithium and and process it here. How, how could Ireland play a part there, and what could we be doing more of? Well, for us, it's really important to make sure that we that we support exploration, that we support the data gathering, that mm -hmm. so that we know where the where the lithium resources are and where the cobalt resources are and all the these other materials as well mm -hmm. across Europe. So we do that with um, European projects, for example. So we have a project called um, Frame running through a GWIRA network. So that's across all of the geological surveys in Europe, where we bring an awful lot of data together and we try and harmonize the data so that. When I talk about a lithium deposit, I'm talking in exactly the same terms that somebody is talking in Poland or in Norway or in Portugal, mm -hmm. so that everybody across Europe is speaking a common language. And I mean, geology doesn't stop at the borders. So then when we look at things on a European level, we can understand where these deposits occur across Europe and where they might occur across borders. 
when somebody has done, maybe someone has done work in Portugal on a deposit, but not in Spain or vice versa. And, and we can bring all that data and knowledge together and, and start to build a better understanding of where we're going to access these resources um, over the next 20 to 30 years. I suppose one of the things people might be cautious of with this mining that could potentially happen here, more mining, I know we have tar mine, already doing zinc, uh, is the environmental, environmental impacts of the mines, you know. Uh, talk me through, you know, what we're seeing around the world with, with the impacts of, of both quarrying and mining and how those impacts can be mitigated, you know, and whether Ireland should say no to mining, you know, what, what impact would that have overall or how does that play out? Well, I think we really need to take responsibility on ourselves to, to ethically source the materials that we're, that we're using. There's no point kind of just exporting our dirty materials somewhere and mm -hmm. saying, well, you know, we're not going to mine here, but we still want to use the material. Mm -hmm. And there's a, there's a tendency that, you know, there's a bit of what we call a virtuous circle in mining. So we say mm -hmm. mining, isn't, mining isn't welcome here because it's dirty. So we send it somewhere where they don't have legal environmental protections they don't have social protections they don't have any um, ethical considerations there and we look at how mining then operates in those countries and we say well you see we told you so it's dirty and it's terrible and people yeah. get hurt and people die but then we use the resources but then we use the resources and, the cars, yeah. and we don't realize that when we mine here we actually mine really well so ireland is really really good at what we do and really good at mining okay and within europe and the european protections we have the strongest environmental protections in the world here and the strongest social okay. and ethical protections as well for workers and yeah. so it, it can be a little bit more expensive to produce here but yeah. that's money that's worth spending okay. and it's money that's worth spending because it's invested into into environmental protections, into making sure that the groundwater resources aren't affected, into making sure that people are paid properly, mm. to making sure that people are working safely. Yeah. So if we are going to mine anywhere, the safest and most responsible place in the planet to mine is in Europe. But yet we tend to outsource it somewhere else. And I often compare it to other, if you compare it to other industries, and, and farming is something we're all really, really familiar with in mm. Ireland. Mm. And everybody understands more or less how farming works. We all know farmers or we're one or two generations removed from, yeah. from people who had, have had farming backgrounds. There's and, a big movement to shop local. Yeah. And, and a lot of people do. Absolutely. They try to, yeah, they should. And so what we don't do is we don't look at, at um, places in Brazil or in, in the Amazon and where they're tearing down the rainforest and planting huge big plantations and yeah. causing huge environmental damage and say, that's what farming looks like, because that's not what farming looks like here. Yeah. So if we look at mining in South America or mining over Af mm. in places in Africa, that's not necessarily what mining looks like here. So mining here is really safe, um, really secure, and, mm. and we do it really, really well. Mm. So very few negative impacts here. Very few. And we're potentially, if we do it here, we're, we're, we're not doing it somewhere where the regulation is poor. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And it might actually encourage other countries to up their regulation. If we, we say, look, here in Europe, we're only going to, you know, uh, uh, you know, if we create an industry, potentially make sure our resources come from ethically mined resources. Yeah. Uh, but that, we'd want yes. to have the industry there first. We'd want to be getting our own lithium somehow. Exactly. Uh, and so so we, maybe we, we need to subsidize it somehow or get it going. Well, it's something that happens in, in farming so that you see that we pay a premium for yeah. local and ethically sourced materials. So I think maybe that we should think about paying a premium for locally and ethically sourced yeah. uh, minerals and yeah. raw materials as well. Fantastic.